This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, hello, hello. Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. And today we have a very, very important show. Like all our shows are important. But it comes from the point of view of being old guys versus young guys. And there's one thing, you know, nobody likes to get old, but there's one thing good about getting old. You have more viewpoint to to look at the world from. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm making a fortune in Bitcoin today, not because I have that much Bitcoin, but I speak for the younger generation. And I always warn that the baby boom generation's in serious trouble, you know, because they drank the Kool-Aid. We were born during one of the biggest booms in world history. 1971, Nixon took us off the gold standard and the economy boomed because they could print trillions of dollars that were fake. And now, you know, that the, in 87, the stock market crash and um, what's his name? Greenspan went in there with the PPT, the plunge protection team and says, don't worry, we'll cover it. We'll, we'll always protect stocks. But to do that, they had to print trillions of dollars to keep the stock market propped up so that baby boomers didn't lose everything. So here's baby boomers, they, you know, the Leave it to Beaver and the Aussie and Harriet crowd, for those of you old enough to remember that, and they drank the Kool-Aid, and now we have Social Security that's broke, Medicare that's broke, and the stock market's set to crash. <laughs> what else could go wrong? And we have, in 1970, I think the debt to GDP was 30%. Today, it's 140%. And people say, well, what's, what's different from 1970 to today is we're broke, we're bankrupt. You know, 30% debt to GDP to 140% debt to GDP that's like you were making 100000 in 1971, let's say, but you had 30000 in expenses. Today, you're making 100000 but your expenses are 140000 a year. And so the boomers are in serious, serious, serious trouble if they don't keep this bond market and stock market propped up. So with that said, a dear old friend, Doug Casey, he and I are the old guys. We've been saying the same old crap for the same, same number of years. We've traveled the world together. And we have the benefit of history. So Doug and, uh, Doug and I were just in um, Cancun, Mexico at the Nomad Capitalist Show. And what I found was interesting, I've done, I've done many of these Nomad Capitalist shows where those types of shows where Americans are looking for a second passport, a second home and a tax haven. But this time they were sold out. They're looking for the second passport, another country to live in and a tax haven. And they're more attentive this year. And there are a lot more younger people. It was really interesting. A lot of Bitcoin millionaires and all this. So Doug Casey and I, the old guys, were there talking to the young guys about where we run to today and what we see. So Doug, welcome to the program. It's good to see you again. Just for a few days ago, we were in Cancun. It was an interesting conference, huh? Yeah, it was, Robert. And it was uh, an excellent excuse to uh, basically get out of lockdown and go to a right. beach resort uh, where most people weren't wearing, wearing masks. And uh, it, it, gave, it gave the appearance of freedom. Uh, so I was, I was very happy to be there. And it was interesting that uh, so many people are looking to get a second crib someplace out of the U.S. because they can see a storm is brewing on the horizon here in the U.S., so uh, I think it's smart. Of course, I've been uh, living on and off in Argentina and Uruguay for years. And um, so I'm, I'm already quite well prepared. Right. Although I'm yeah. speaking to you from, from Virginia right now at the moment. That's, that's what Doug and I were saying is that you guys are looking to move. We already moved a long time ago. <laughs> so yeah. Doug, let me ask this question. Because you and I have been saying the same thing. And unfortunately, what we've been saying has come true. That's the saddest part of all. Well, it's just starting to come true, actually. I mean, we're just entering the yeah. uh, trailing edge of the hurricane. And yeah. as, I, as I like to say, it's going to be much worse and much longer lasting and much different than the unpleasantness of uh, 1929 to 1946. And I hate to uh, sound like I'm crying wolf because Right now, everything's hung together with chewing gum and bailing wire, uh, helped along by trillions of dollars 
of new funny money being uh, created. So far, it looks pretty good, but uh, it's not going to look good, I think, in as little as three or six months. So, Doug, let's, let's go back in time, because like I said, you and I, the old guys, we've been together for all these years. We've been, you know, we've been, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. People keep saying, you don't know what you're talking about. But unfortunately, the sky is falling. So how did you, give us a little bit of your background. Where were you born? How did you come to this um, sky is falling mentality? Well, I grew up on a normal middle class existence in Chicago on the Southwest side. Went to a four year military boarding school which is somewhat unusual. Uh, I did the same thing. Ah, yes, I know. And you went to the Coast Guard Academy, actually. No, Merchant uh, Marine Academy. I had, I had nominations in Naval and Kings Point. I took Kings Point. Ah. Coast well, Guard had to be smart. <laughs> <laughs> well, good choice on your, uh, on your port, actually. Uh, I, I've said when I, when I had a full hour uh, in uh, November of 1980, uh, the day before uh, the Reagan election, uh, I was on the Phil, uh, Phil Donahue show for a full hour by myself. And one of the two things that made the office, the, the um, audience boomy, was that I said that uh, I considered my four years at university a misallocation of my time and my money, and that I wouldn't do it again. And of course, I was pretty far ahead of the curve because then, College degree was, uh, everybody wanted one. But today, I, th I think most people recognize, even if they go to college, that uh, it, it's an idiotic misallocation. In fact, it's not even, it's not even a misallocation. It's a corrupting influence where <laughs> Marxist professors oh, are in their head full of phony baloney ideas. And, <laughs> and later on, I became a uh, trustee of the uh, tenth oldest college in uh, in the country, and uh, then I found out how bad it was. That was twenty years ago. Uh, that all the professors, in um, except for the sciences, uh, were were basically uh, Marxists under the skin. <laughs> but today it's much worse, and I actively encourage kids to uh, put their thinking cap on and figure out what can I do with this four years of time and let's say $100,000 of capital that I'm going to use to uh, subsidize the enemy. So uh, anyway, so I, made what, that, I made that mistake. When, and, did, when, did you, when did you see the future? I mean, that's, like I said, you and I have been saying the same thing for years. You know, my, my wake up call came in Vietnam right six months after Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard and I went flying behind enemy lines looking for gold. And the little Vietnamese woman educated me on gold in no uncertain terms. That gold was spot price. It's spot. I said, what the hell's spot? Okay. You know? It was kind of my wake up call. I, I thought for a minute you were going to tell me you were <clears throat> going for an adventure like that movie with George Clooney, Three Kings, or the one with um, Clint Eastwood, uh, Kelly's Heroes, where they were going to, where you were going yeah. to steal the gold. One of my favorite <laughs> movies. <laughs> well, uh, no, I dodged that bullet uh, in uh, Vietnam, so to speak. I was, um, <clears throat> in retrospect, idiotically signed up for the Marine PLC program. God, that's the well, best thing you could have done. <laughs> well, I, I listen, if you're going to join a, a U.S. service, I, I think it really has to be the Marines, quite I frankly. Agree. But, I, uh, but I, for those I, who, I, I was draft exempt. And if I said, if I'm going to go to Vietnam, who am I going to go to war with? And I went to this big rally and they had the Air Force, Coast Guard, Navy, Marine Corps and Army. And then and the Coast Guard stood up there and says, we save people's lives. And the Marine recruiter stood up there and says, we kill people. We, we and, and, people. And, 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 and break things besides. No, it sounded, it sounded like more, more fun. But uh, that was my first entrepreneurial venture actually that kept me out of the, uh, uh, out of the war because um, I've always been a car guy. And in those days, in 1966 and 67, uh, I spent my junior year abroad at the University of Freiburg in uh, Switzerland. And uh, 
always keeping my eye on exotic cars, Ferraris and Maseratis. And they were very cheap in Europe in those days, but very expensive in the US. Interesting arbitrage opportunity. Europeans, at that time, only 20 years recovered from World War II, didn't have much of a middle class. If you bought a Ferrari, you were a rich guy. If, otherwise, you'd buy a Fiat. There was nothing in between. But <laughs> Americans all wanted Ferraris in a middle class society. You could buy a used Ferrari. So there was a huge arbitrage between the two continents. And um, so I, um, I bought a car, I, I raced it at uh, Mollery and uh, Monza, and uh, was driving it up to uh, Rotterdam to put on a boat, having doubled my money from $3,000 to 6,000, sight unseen, and got into a terrible auto accident, was in a hospital for six weeks, broke my right leg in 17. Anyway, that's why I never went to Vietnam. And, and I'm glad I didn't because you were lucky, but not everybody was. Right. So, but when did the lights go on about, you know, like you and I have been singing the praises of gold and all this stuff for years and years and years. And, you know, you've lived in Argentina and Uruguay and you've seen those countries come apart, haven't you? Well, and they're still coming apart. Argentina in particular, Uruguay yeah. is going through a relatively mellow period at the moment. In fact, there are many thousands of middle-class and wealthier Argentines that are moving across the Plate River to uh, Uruguay right now because the, uh, the government in uh, Argentina is criminally insane, which it usually is, <laughs> but it's really bad now. Yeah. So uh, when, did, when did I first discover uh, economics? It certainly wasn't taking classes in college. That was a waste of time. It was when I read uh, Henry Hazlitt's book, Economics in One Lesson, which is only about 150 pages, but it's a work of genius. Uh, that was the first thing. Then I read Harry Brown's book, uh, How to Profit from the Coming Devaluation, uh, which he turned out just before the devaluation. And I started buying gold coins way back then. I have never sold one. And later on, since I was always interested in geology, it was uh, the third thing I wanted to be when I was a kid. After a paleontologist, after an archaeologist, I wanted to be a geologist. So then I started uh, getting interested in mining stocks. And uh, that's more or less what I've been doing since then. So for those who may not know, I mean, Doug Casey is a legend. I mean, he is a legend. So to run into him last week in Cancun, just have dinner with him again and just catch up. Like I said, we're the old guys, and we've seen this happening, coming. I was in Argentina with my brother, and I, I, I introduced him to the bird boy because I was shooting dove out there. And the bird boy used to be a civil engineer. And he said, I said, what happened to you? He says, I had a million U.S. in the bank in Argentina, Buenos Aires. And they, well, nationalized, it. they nationalized it. My brother said, what's that? He said, they turned it into pesos. Yeah, that's happened to so many middle-class Argentines that have been dropped into the lower classes because of exactly that, uh, foolishly leaving their money in the national currency. Uh, look, when I started playing polo uh, oh, 30 years ago, there was, a, um, there was a guy named Hap Sharp, and he first became famous in the 1960s or having developed a famous race car called the Chaparral with Jim Hall. Anyway, he was part of the club that I was and he bought a ranch in um, Patagonia, 250,000 acres. And he paid, oh, I don't know, back then, $100,000. They're still very cheap. You can still get 250,000 acres in Argentina for $100,000. But the guy who sold it to him took a, a note from him for uh, in Argentine pesos. And it, it, he got the ranch for free as they destroyed that particular peso. Then came the Austral and then came the, they, they've had five currencies there. It's, and it's such a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful country. It is oh. a rich country with poor government. But anyway, we're gonna have to take a break. We'll be, we'll be right back. I mean, this is so interesting. But we're going to take a break and we'll be right back. Welcome back with Doug Casey, the international man. We'll be talking about what's going on in the world. 
And like I, I've been saying this whole time, the sad part about it is what we've been saying for years when we were young guys is coming true as old guys. But anyway, well, let's get back to rich country and poor government. We we're talking at the start of the show. So we've seen this, you know, we've, we have history on our side with our age, but you were living in Aspen and you moved to Virginia. Now, you know, for most people, Aspen is utopia, the Marxist. It is a Marxist utopia because a lot of Marxists live there. But why did you move out of Aspen? Well, I first came to the People's Republic of Aspen in 1979. <laughs> and in those days, it was still the land of soft snow, hard drugs, and casual sex. <laughs> and, and all those three things still exist. But it's, uh, it's changed character since then. Uh, all the houses are completely unaffordable. If you want a detached house in Aspen, I defy you to find anything for less than $5 million dollars. Uh, the average price, probably close to 10 million. Many, many houses uh, at the 20 or $30 million level. This is a small town. So, um, you know, that doesn't appeal to me. More than that, it's the people that are moving into town now. The billionaires are driving the multimillionaires down Valley to find it unaffordable. And in this little town of 8,000 people, there's an unbelievable 2,500 so-called employee housing units uh, in Aspen. 8,000 people, 2,500 employee housing units. What are they? They're places that are subsidized or built by the government for uh, so-called worker bees to live in. And of course, they all vote communists because they like having free housing. So it's pretty hopeless. Uh, you can't have an intelligent conversation with anybody in Aspen these days. They're, they're all ultra leftists. Well, as it is in the People's Republic of Boulder and, and a lot of these ritzy little towns. So, um, you know, I picked a, a small town in Virginia on the water where I'll hang out part of the year. The rest so, of the time I'll still be in Argentina and Uruguay. Right. So uh, when, when, when Doug and I were just in Cancun, I, mean, I, I pitched a deal to him that you, myself, and records, because we're the old guys, we've seen this thing coming for years and we've warned people, we've warned people. The possibility, we haven't decided to do it yet, but do a quarterly update where you say, this is what I, you've seen, I'll say what I've seen, and records talks about what he saw. So my question to you before we end, what do you see from here? Because you saw this years and years ago. We're on the doorstep now. What do you see in the next few years? Well, it seemed to me that things would go over the edge uh, with the uh, manic bull market of 2000. Uh, then I thought it was going to surely go over the edge with the real estate meltdown of 2008. Uh, I didn't give adequate credit to the government's ability to print up trillions of dollars and get away with it. And I didn't give adequate credit to their ability to take interest that rates down to near zero. But I'm asking myself, what other feathers, what other arrows do they have in their quiver now that they've uh, you know, printed up unbelievable amounts of money and taken interest rates to, to near zero? What can they do next? And I don't see what they can do next. Do you? I mean, Never say never say never. Whatever they do will be stupid. But but they're acting. <laughs> the U.S. government is acting exactly the way the Argentine government has been acting for many years. Right. And, and the results are going to be the same: a uh, greatly diminished standard of living uh, with the average American, and probably a lot of violence in the streets. Because uh, look, a lot of people are under real financial pressure. Uh, for instance, one of the most disturbing th things is the fact that there are still several million Americans living in apartments that uh, are in forbearance, where their rent, I understand, is being accumulated, and they're not having to pay rent. And there are a couple of million mortgage uh, holders or mortgage mortgagees that aren't having to pay on their mortgage. So what happens when these people have to start paying again? and catch up on what they've missed over the last 18 months. Uh, it doesn't look good to me. It doesn't either. I mean, so you have a crystal ball yet? Well, all I can tell you is what I'm doing. 
And as I look at the markets, the stock market is in a hyper bubble. It's crazier than it was in 2000 and around there. Uh, because now much more of the public is involved in it. So uh, it's going to revert to the mean. I don't want to be in the stock market. Uh, the bond market is in a hyper bubble. Uh, you know, if interest rates just go back to historic average levels, uh, the bond market will fall in half. That's a disaster because most pension funds are mainly invested in bonds. And of course, real estate floats on a, uh, a bubble of borrowed money. And when interest rates go back, well, the mortgage I just took out, large mortgage, two and a half percent, 30 year fixed. So mortgages go back up to the 6% area, which is kind of like a normal thing over the last 50 years. Uh, it can smash the real estate market. Plus, of course, local governments are in a lot of trouble. They'll raise real estate taxes. That's where the rich people are. Uh, I mean, what do you think, Robert? I mean, you've made so much money in the real estate market. Am I missing something? No, I agree 100% with you. I think the biggest, uh, the biggest, fattest cow is real estate taxes. They're, you know, they're, and you can't avoid paying them because if you don't pay them, you take your house. find out who really owns your house. Yeah. And that's, that's you, you, you and I think, you know, must be intelligent because we, we think the same way. I think they're setting, they're setting it up so all these people come into real estate and they'll raise the taxes. Then you got them. They won't run. Yeah. Real estate prices will crash. And that's the, uh, being a real estate guy, that's the worst I can see coming. Well, you know, uh, real estate has been very, very good to me. And I, I've lived in 10 different countries around the world and owned real estate in uh, two thirds of them. So, uh, no, real estate's been very, very good to me, but you know, there's a, there's a time to buy and a time to sell. And, 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 and something's very interesting. There, um, a lot of people don't think about this. When I wrote my um, crisis investing for the 90s book, uh, there was still a lot of worry about world population going to 10 and then 15 million and 20 million. And what are we gonna do with all these people? The globe is gonna be covered with them. But uh, there's something new developing, and that is a falling world population. All over the world, the population is falling, with the exception of Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, it, what are, to give you an idea, by the end of the century, there are reasonable project projections that the population of China will have fallen from 1.4 billion back to an incredible 600 million. In other words, what it was before Mao came on. So what's gonna to happen to all those buildings and all that infrastructure that was built for a billion extra people? What's gonna happen? Same thing is gonna happen in the US. Of course, unless the US is overwhelmed by migration, which is likely to happen, incidentally. <clears throat> well, what's, what's gonna to happen to all the shopping centers that Amazon just wiped out, you know? Hey, a quick question. When you think of Russia and China, give me, 10, 10 words each, what do you see with Russia and China? Well, Russia is not a threat. Uh, it, it, it's got a serious demographic population decline in addition to the fact that everybody's drunk. Uh, I, I would say <laughs> Russia can best be described as a uh, gasoline station with an attached gun store in the middle of a wheat field. So, uh, uh, Russia is a, is a non-threat, and it's crazy, provoking them. Uh, China is a different story. In the long run, I suspect that China is going to break up into at least a half a dozen different countries. Wow. That's my guess. I mean, look, what's ha what happened in, in the Soviet Union, breaking up into 15 uh, republics, you know, many of those republics themselves should break up uh, ethnically. Yugoslavia broke up into six. Czechoslovakia broke into two. Uh, there are uh, secession movements uh, active in Spain especially, but Scotland is going to split, split off from Britain with a little bit of luck. This is a worldwide trend, I think, and it's gonna happen in China too. Uh, 
I mean, the Chinese don't just speak Mandarin. They speak, uh, oh goodness, how many major languages do they speak besides Mandarin? They have different cultures. There's antagonisms towards Beijing. No, I think China could break up, but that's in the long run. In the short run, uh, the next 20 years belong to China. They really do. I agree. So, so I, I was, you know, I was, I was in Cameroon and Zimbabwe, and I saw whole Chinese camps out there. Yeah, Africa. it's happening all over. It's happening all over Africa. But uh, so the Africans have got to worry about their homeland being taken over by uh, actually hundreds of millions of Chinese. That's actually possible. Uh, that's, the, that's the bad news for the Africans. But the good news is that hundreds of millions of Africans are going to move to Europe. Uh, that's bad news for the Europeans. So there's going to be a lot of uh, demographic chaos in the world, I think. I agree. Did you happen to stay when we're in Cancun listening to the, the, the president of this, the Soviet uh, country of Georgia speak? Shosh Kabili, yes. He was impressive. Uh, he, he was impressive. He, he wasn't a libertarian, but he's about as close as you can come to um, a real free market guy uh, in Europe. So, yeah, I was very positively impressed by him. Yeah, just for, for those who uh, I hate to talk about things we didn't, you weren't there at, but he took, he took the Soviet Republic of Georgia from like 127th in the world to number eight in the world. And so his, his opening statement is, what did you do to do that? He says, first thing, you had to get rid of corruption. That was step one. And number one spot for corruption was the police force. And I thought that was really, and that, he says that was the most dangerous. The second most dangerous was customs. Then they had, to, they had to lower taxes and increase the speed of government services. Well, and it's indicative of just the sorry state of human nature is that uh, Saakashvili uh, made huge improvements in the country. And then what happens? He's kicked out of office. Yep. Pretty much the same thing has happened in Chile. Yep. I mean, Chile, in, when um, Allende took over, I mean, he was a, an avowed and strident Marxist. Uh, then he was um, uh, assisted in shedding this mortal coil by uh, Pinochet in, uh, what was it, 1973. And subsequently, for the next 30 years, Chile boomed. I mean, it was a backward little mining province. It was a nothing, nowhere place. Now, Chile is the most advanced country by far in Latin America. So what do the Chileans do? They elect a communist in the last election. I mean, this is the way, this is the way it always works. Uh, so uh, I, I don't know where you run and hide at this moment, Robert, because the problem is, is that the U.S., is slipping away right beneath our feet. I, I call it the U.S. because it used to be America, and America was a totally unique and excellent place. But now America is just an idea, and we're devolving into just another socialist state like 200 others in the world. It's a real pity. When America's gone, where do we go? That's why we're all at Cancun. You know, because a lot of people are starting to run. So, Doug, what's your latest piece of work, and how do people stay in touch with you? Well, uh, the third, my third novel in a series is called Assassin, which uh, talks about why some people should uh, get their just desserts, uh, <laughs> actually. So, read Assassin. Uh, secondly, I have a, uh, a blog called The International Man, internationalman.com. Pretty interesting, I think. Yeah. And third, I have a program which is kind of competitive, but not really, with what you're doing, Robert, and that's called Doug Casey's Take. That's good. So, oh. Those three but, things. Because we all there's a big world to see out there. The sad part is what we've been saying is coming true. So anyway, uh, thank you very much, and let's keep up the educational process. So thank you, Mr. Doug. I look forward to talking to you again, Robert. So right. Thank you. And we'll be back. We'll be with a final wrap up for the uh, Rich Dad Radio Show. Thank you, Doug, once again.
Welcome back. This is Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. I want to thank Doug Casey. He and I just came back from Cancun, Mexico, for the Nomad Capital Show. For those of you who are thinking about running and gunning, <clears throat> it was an international show. People came from all over the world. But predominantly, it was Americans, and most were young. I thought that was really, really interesting. Like I said, Doug and I have known each other for years, and we go to these shows, and we're the old guys. And this time, we were still... We're the young guys, now we're the old guys. But unfortunately, everything we've been saying for all these years is coming true. And so that's why some of the young people were at the Nomad Capitalist Show. There's a lot of places you can run to and hide second passports and tax havens and all that. But um, it's a complicated process. So that's why I don't recommend things necessarily, but you know, if you really want to start to run anywhere in the world, they covered it pretty extensively. And so it's called the Nomad Capitalist. We've had Andrew on our show. And it's important to know where you can run to. So, Sarah, what did you think of the show today with Doug? Well, you know, Doug's always a, a wealth of knowledge. Um, but I think a couple of things I took away the most, the realization that you guys were talking about, are young people are starting to catch on. And we're seeing that with Bitcoin, right? They're right. finally understanding that the dollar's worth zero. They're, they want to avoid. So I think this is a cool trend to see with the younger generation, like, with information at their fingertips and, um, you know, all of the years of old guys like you and Doug teaching these lessons, they're finally catching on. So I think that's cool. I think it's kind of, um, it was a great catch up episode, but then the other thing was your, was talking about the predictions of Russia and China. Like I thought that was the, something I'd never heard before about. He predicts that China will break up into 10 or 15 countries. So it's pretty cool. Just because of the languages. And then the thing about he's lived in, you know, Argentina, and if you've ever been, you have a chance to go to our, it was one of the most beautiful countries. Talk about Patagonia and all that. <clears throat> of course, that's where a lot of the Germans ran to <laughs> when they escaped Nazism. All the Nazis escaped there. So it's very European. It's very elegant. It's a rich country. Sadly, it's a communist government. And America's going the same way. I, so wanna, I, th I thought it was interesting to say about Aspen also, because it's like... Yeah. Yeah, well, I want to. That kind of ties it together. So he had a quote. I watched one of his videos. He did an interview with Kitco, which you're on a lot. He said, "Your main risk today is political. It's political risk. Your financial risks, your economic risks are huge. Greater than that, though, is political risk. Even the people that have passports don't understand that the property of the U.S. government and it, that it's the property of the U.S. government and it can be taken away from you for a lot of reasons. So I think we're seeing. He saw these trends happening in Argentina, and, and he's starting. Not starting. He's seeing them happen here. Yeah. He's really an international man. He's traveled the world. And um, his wealth of knowledge is fantastic. And he's also on the Donahue show, which is on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And he hasn't changed what he's been saying. <clears throat> the sad thing is coming true. Right. So with that, I want to thank you all for listening. To <coughs> thank you. So with that, I want to thank you all for listening to the Rich Dad Radio Show. And uh, stay tuned. Thank you for listening to the Rich Dad Radio Show.